Yeah, good morning, everyone. Oh, is it extra loud? Good morning, ma'am. Yeah, yeah. So we are almost at the end of our doctrinal foundations. We have one more foundation to go next week. That would be the end times. But today we will deal with the doctrine of angels. So this would be the this recording. Yeah, so we will be doing um, Doctrine of Angels today, and uh, next week we will finish with End Times. So let's get started. Uh, maybe we can look at one verse which talks about God creating the angels. Uh, so that would be Psalm 148, verses 2 to 5. So anyone who has their Bible open, if you could read out for us Psalm 148, verses Two to five. We are two minutes into the class. You should have your Bibles open by now. Psalm one forty eight. Verses 2 to 5. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his hosts. Praise him, Thank sun you. and moon. Yeah. Praise him. So it says in Psalm 148, verse 2, Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his heavenly hosts. And then it goes on to explain that these hosts and angels have been created at the command of the Lord. It says that in verse 5, Psalm 148, 5. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for at his command they were created. So just like human beings, angels also are created beings. So um, angels may have some superior powers. Uh, in status-wise, they may have a different status from humans, but they are also just created beings like us. So the angels of God the ones who stayed faithful to God, they are created beings. And even the fallen angels, which became demons, they also are just created beings. So all angels, however powerful they may consider themselves to be, they are all under the control of the creator God. So in the same way, we are dependent on God. Even the angelic beings are dependent on God. You know, they are not in any way um, independent just because they have more power. So what should be our approach to angels? Okay, so let's get into that right away. Um, the first thing, we believe in the existence of angels. We believe that angels have been, you know, uh, placed by God to serve the church, to serve the believers. But we are very clearly told in scripture not to worship angels in any way. So let's look at a couple of scriptures which emphasize that. Uh, if we can maybe first read out Colossians chapter 2 verse 18. Colossians 2 18. Let no one cheat you of your reward, taking delight in false humility and worship of angels intruding into those things which he has not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. So in Colossians 2.18, it's talking about some people in the church who had kind of gotten sidetracked. sidetracked. They were kind of going into these um, mystical Jewish teachings where uh, the where interaction with angels was emphasized. Um, there was this one segment of the Jews who believed in uh, mystical teachings. They believed in making contact with angels. Uh, they believed in receiving messages and visions from the angels. And they believed that they were superior to all the other believers because they were receiving this kind of special uh, messages and revelations 
from the angels. So here, uh, when Paul is writing to the Colossian believers, he says, that's a dangerous thing to do. He says, um, these people, they boast of worshipping angels, but that will disqualify them from the kingdom of God. So it is a very serious and dangerous thing to indulge in the worship of angels. And Paul goes on to say that these people, they talk in great detail about what they have seen and they are puffed up with idle notions by their unspiritual mind. So they would boast to all the other members in the church saying, you know, the angel came to me and the angel revealed this particular message to me. And they were, they were beginning to spread false teachings which they have received from these angelic beings. So Paul warns and says, do not worship angels and do not, you know, receive false teachings from them and do not boast about visions and revelations and dreams which you have received from the angels. Um, we also see in Revelation 19 verses 9 to 10, John's response when he encounters an angel. I mean, we are familiar with this verse. Um, and in fact, this, this particular event happens, you know, a couple of times. Uh, but if we could read out Revelation 19, 9 and 10. Then he said to me, right, blessed are those who call, are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, see that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. But the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Now, this is a passage which is talking about John. John uh, was one disciple uh, who considered himself very close to Jesus. He's the one who rested his head you know, on the bosom of Jesus at the Last Supper. This man who worships Jesus, who is completely loyal to Jesus, and in fact, who in the end, you know, is martyred for the sake of Jesus. This man, when he encounters an angel, what is his response? He is so overcome with awe at what he is seeing that he literally falls down on his knees and tries to worship this angel. So the angelic beings really are very grand to look at. When you look at them, you, are, you feel awe because they are so different from humans. They are so much grander, bigger, superior, that you almost feel like worshipping them. And this is something which John is doing. I mean, you would not expect that of John, you know. Um, so, which is why that in warning which Paul gives in Colossians 2.18 is a very valid warning. Angels um, are so impressive that we, in our very limited, small human minds, may actually want to worship them, you know, if we, if we see them. So, Paul very clearly warns and says, do not indulge in such things, because that will disqualify you from the kingdom of God. And so here, when uh, John, who is, you know, overcome with awe by the, uh, the grandeur of this angel that he is seeing, and he literally falls down on his knees and tries to worship the angel, this is what the angel says. The angel says, don't do that. I am a fellow servant with you and with your brothers. So he says, just the way you are a servant of Jesus Christ, I am also a servant of Jesus Christ. Both of us are equal in status when it comes to serving our Lord and Master. So don't worship me. Worship him. Worship God is what the angel says. So even though angels may look very uh, grand and awesome, uh, we are warned in the scriptures not to worship angels in any way. A second thing that we would need to keep in mind from the scriptures uh, is found in 2 Corinthians 11, 13 to 14. So if someone could read out 2 Corinthians 11, 13 to 14. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. 
So when Paul is writing to the Corinthian believers, he says, be careful. Um, there are going to be false teachers who will come to you and they will present themselves as teachers of the light. In the same way, Satan also pretends to be an angel of light. So when angels come to us, you know, if any of us has an encounter or a vision or a revelation from an angel, the first thing we would need to ask ourselves is, whatever this angel is revealing, is it in line with scripture? And if what the angel is saying is not in line with scripture, however grand that angel may look, however divine he may look, we just choose to reject that message because it is not lining up with, with what the word of God, what Jesus has said. So Jesus, the word of God, is our standard to whom we look up to. Jesus is the one who is our master. Jesus is our God and Lord whom we worship. So um, if any angel comes to us pretending to be an angel of light and gives any message which contradicts what Jesus has spoken, we automatically reject it. Um, and in fact, in Galatians uh, 1.8, Paul says the same thing to the uh, believers of Galatia. Uh, Galatians 1.8, if someone could read out. Galatians 1.8, if someone could read out. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you, that what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. So Paul, you know, is very firm in what he says here. Even if an angel comes to you, you know, in all of his grandeur and preaches something to you that contradicts the gospel which has been taught by Jesus, then, you know, let that angel be accursed. Let a curse come upon that angel is what he says. So, um, just because angels look very grand and because in our eyes they look almost divine, we must not just simply accept whatever they say. They may be false angels of light. You know, they're actually angels of darkness pretending to be angels of light. So um, Paul warns that even if an angel were to preach something that contradicts the gospel of Jesus Christ, we should be, uh, you know, uh, ready to reject that. So the two, two things that we see from the scriptures is that we must never worship angels. We must worship Jesus. And in the same way, uh, we must accept the gospel of Jesus Christ, what he has taught and what he has preached. And we must not accept the um, false doctrines which are brought by angels. A third thing that we are warned about in scripture, which um, is a little more difficult to understand, uh, would be the two passages in Second Peter and in Jude. So we will look at that now. Uh, we will first maybe look at Second Peter chapter two, verses ten to twelve. Second Peter chapter two, verses ten to twelve. And especially those who walk according to the flesh in the lust of the uncleanness and despise authority, they are presumptions self-willed, they are not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries, whereas angels who are greater in power and might do not bring a reviling accusation against them before the Lord. All right. So here we see uh, that Peter talks about certain false teachers who have no respect for authority of any kind. So here, Peter, in fact, he says in uh, the first verse of chapter 2, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1, he says that these false teachers are secretly introducing destructive heresies. These false teachers are secretly introducing uh, you know, wrong kinds of teachings into the church. And he goes on to say they don't even have any fear for God himself. They have no fear or respect even for God. And in the same way, they don't have any fear or respect for God. He says they don't they don't have any fear of the 
um, celestial beings either. And over here, the celestial beings that are being talked about are, um, you know, the fallen angels and the demons, uh, because these are um, celestial beings against whom the angels spoke judgment. So these are not good celestial beings that are being talked about. These are evil, fallen, uh, heavenly beings that are being talked about over here. So these false teachers, they had no respect for God. They were introducing false teachings into the church. And they were also speaking very mockingly about the angelic beings. Uh, we, we are not told exactly in what way they slandered the angels. Uh, we are not told exactly what kind of uh, um, you know evil things they were saying about these uh, evil spirits. But Paul says this is not uh, Peter. Peter says that this is not a wise thing to do. Um, so his argument is that when the when the angels of God, the good angels, when they were asked to bring judgment upon these evil spirits, even they were very careful in the way they spoke. So when the angels themselves were so careful in speaking against these evil spirits, when they were bringing judgment upon them, shouldn't humans be more careful in the way they deal with the uh, demonic spirits. So that's the argument that he brings out over here. Um, and we get a little more clarity regarding this passage in uh, Jude, which talks about the very same event. So if we were to go to Jude, which only has one chapter, and if we were to uh, read out verses 8 to 10, let us see what uh, you know explanation is given over there. Jude like chapter 1, verses 8 to 10. Likewise, also these dreamers defile the flesh, reject authority, and speak evil of dignitaries. Yet Michael, the archangel, in contending with the devil, when he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not bring against him a reviling accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke you. So here we see that um, we get to know a little bit about what Peter was referring to when he said uh, when the angels had to bring judgment on the evil spirits, they were careful what they spoke. Uh, we get more uh, clarity on this event in the uh, Jude letter, where we get to know that uh, the devil wanted to make uh, wrong use of Moses' body. You know, Maybe he wanted to get hold of that body and get the Israelites to worship the dead body of Moses or something. We don't we don't really know in what way he wanted to misuse the uh, the body of Moses. But at that time, God sends uh, Archangel Michael to him to speak against him and bring judgment upon him. At that time, when the Archangel Michael, who is a very very high uh, high level angel, when he is speaking to the devil. He does not, you know, abuse uh, the devil verbally in any way. He just simply says, may the Lord rebuke you. May the Lord judge you. So he only just speaks the judgment which God has, you know, asked him to give and he leaves. So the argument that both Peter and Jude make is this. They say, when even the angels are so careful in the way they speak about the demons and to the demons, shouldn't humans be a little more wise in the way they talk about the uh, demons? So in both of these passages, uh, the, um, the believers are clearly told that they must not just mockingly uh, slander demons as and when they wish. So if this is the case, then how should we believers actually deal with angels? What does the scriptures tell us about this? What should be our dealings with evil spirits and demonic beings? Three main things. The first to remember is that we should never be afraid of the demons. That is very, very clear. Okay, so we are warned not to slander the demons and speak recklessly about them. But at the same time, we do not need to be afraid of them in any way. Let's look at a couple of scriptures which bring out this very important truth. First John chapter 4, verses 3 to 4. First John 4, 3 to 4.
and every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because he who, he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Now these believers, in uh, uh, the, to whom John is writing, he says, Dear children, you belong to God. So you don't have to be worried about these demons. He says, you know, because you belong to God, you have overcome them. The one who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. So you do not have to be afraid of the demons. In fact, you can overcome them and have victory over them. Okay, so um, uh, in 1 John 4, 3 to 4, we are given the assurance that because we can overcome the demons, we do not have to be afraid of them in any way. Also, we are given an assurance in Romans chapter 8, verses 37 to 39. Romans 8, 37 to 39. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Here, Paul gives a list of things which cannot separate us from the love of God. So in the list of things which are mentioned, angels and demons are also mentioned. And Paul very clearly says that these angels and demons cannot separate us from the love of God. We are safe and secure in God. So we do not have to be afraid of, a, of, of demons in any way. We can overcome them through Christ. And we also are safe in Christ's love. God's love um, uh, you know, protects us. And angels and demons cannot separate us from the love of God. So this is the assurance that we are given. So yes. In 2 Peter and in Jude, we are warned not to be reckless in the way we talk about the demons, that we are not supposed to slander demons in the way we speak. But at the same time, we do not have to be afraid of them in any way. The second thing that we need to keep in mind in our dealings with demons is that we are commanded to resist them and fight them. We don't have to submit to them. We don't have to be afraid of them and think, oh, they are so powerful. What can a mere human being do against them? You know, so no, we are clearly commanded that we have the authority to resist them and also fight them. So again, we look at a couple of scriptures which bring out this. Um, James 4, 7. If someone could read out James 4, 7. Therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. So in this verse, we are told that as long as we are living in obedient submission to the Lord, we can resist the devil. The devil and the demons cannot you know, um, take any action against us as long as we are living in submission to the Lord. As long as we are under his covering and his protection, uh, the demons cannot, you know, um, they cannot force us into sin or uh, meddle with our lives. So we, in Christ, we can resist the devil. So we are expected to resist the devil. Uh, the second thing, Ephesians chap chapter 6, verse 12. Ephesians 6, verse 12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. So here we are told that we are engaged in a battle, in a struggle with these um, demonic forces. Here the demonic forces are, are referred to as rulers, as authorities, as powers. Different names are given to them. But the fact is that 
we are engaged in a battle with them and we have been given a heavenly armor that we can wear so that we will be able to fight them and overcome them successfully so to repeat once again we are told not to slander and speak against demons in a reckless careless manner because even the archangel was very careful in the way he addressed the demons he only spoke in the name of god and said may the lord rebuke you he did not just casually talk to the devil in any way that he wished but at the same time we never have to be afraid of them because god is for us and second we are we have the power to resist them we have the power to fight them and overcome them the third thing that we need to remember is that when we are directly speaking to the demons we only do it in the name of jesus we have to understand that we are humans we have no strength of our own we have no authority of our own whatever strength we have is the strength which we have received from jesus whatever authority we have it is the authority which we carry because jesus has delegated that authority to us so we cannot directly speak to the demons in our own strength or in our own authority we only approach them and deal with them in the name of jesus by the authority and power which he has given us against these creatures so um luke 10 17 to 19 brings out this uh, teaching very well uh, luke 10 17 to 19 if someone could read out then the 70 returned with joy saying lord even the demons are subject to us in your name and he said to them i saw satan fall like lightning from heaven behold i give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you this is what jesus says to the 72 uh, missionaries whom he has sent out and the same i know um, promise is there even for us today even as we are doing ministry uh, jesus says i have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy not just some of the power of the enemy but all the power of the enemy jesus has promised i have given you authority to overcome all of the power of the enemy so we can you know um, directly confront the demons in the name of jesus and they will submit to us they will have to submit because we are confronting them in the name of jesus by the power and authority which he has given us so um how do we exercise this authority in the name of jesus when we are confronting you know demons um let's look at one negative um, example which we find in acts chapter 19 verses 13 to 16 acts 19 13 to 16 what does it say there then some of the itinerant jewish exorcists took it upon themselves to call the name of the lord jesus over those who had evil spirits saying we exorcise you by the jesus whom paul preaches and there were seven sons of skiva a jewish self priest who did so and the evil spirit answered and said jesus i know and paul i know but who are you then the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them overpowered them and prevailed against them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded now these seven sons of a jewish chief priest they used the name of jesus to confront the demons but it did not work why when in the earlier example we you know in luke chapter 10 when the 72 went and confronted the demons in the name of jesus they said joyfully to jesus lord in your when they when we used your name they submitted to us so they were successful and the demons submitted to them when they used the name of jesus however 
the seven sons of the Jewish chief priest, when they tried to use the name of Jesus, it did not work. So what is the difference? The 72 were disciples, followers of Jesus. They had accepted Jesus as their Lord and Master. They were in submission and obedience to the Lord Jesus. So the, Jesus gave them the authority to be able to overcome the demons. On the other hand, the seven sons of the Jewish chief priest, they did not have any kind of a relationship with Jesus. They had not submitted to the Lord Jesus. They had not made him their Lord and Master. So the Jesus had not delegated them with any authority. So you see, when we you know, it, Jesus' name is not a magic word or a magic charm which we use. There's a relationship involved. When we submit to the Lord and we live in obedience to Him, when we accept Him as Lord and Master, then He gives His followers the authority which they require. Like He promises in Luke 10, He says, I have given you authority to overcome all the power of the enemy. So that is why even in the earlier verses that we looked at, James 4, 7, it says, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. There's always this, um, this underlying principle that when you are living in submission to the Lord Jesus, then the authority which he delegates to you will be effective. You will be able to walk in that authority and overcome any work of the evil one. And the, the evil one will have to submit to you because you have, you're holding in your hand the authority which Jesus has given. So when we use those words in Jesus' name, it's not like a chant. It's not like a magic uh, word. It literally means in the authority which Jesus has given to me, I am commanding you to come out of that person, you know, who is being demon possessed. So when you say in Jesus' name, you are directly saying, I am standing over here in the authority that Jesus has given to me. And with that authority of Jesus, I am commanding you to come out of that person who is possessed and the demons would have to submit. So it is all about our submission to the Lord. It is all about how much we are abiding in him. It's all about how clearly we are hearing from him and following his instructions. So all that gives us that um, authority and power to be able to overcome the evil one. So we do not have to be afraid of the demons. We are in fact commanded to resist the demons and fight against the principalities and powers. And third, we are told that we can exercise authority over all the power of the evil one, but how? Only in the name of Jesus in submission to him. Okay, so um, these, uh, so because of these three points, we do not have to fear the demons in any way. We can, in fact, overcome them. Um, another thing that, um, another concept that maybe we can dwell upon is about this whole idea of guardian angels. Um, and there's only one single scripture, you know, which is used to talk about this. Let's look at that scripture. Matthew chapter 18, verse 10. Take heed that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I say to you that in heaven, their angels always see the fa face of my father who is in heaven. Okay, so... Um... The reason that we are looking at all these different points is that we will have the right perspective regarding angels. So the first thing we saw is that we should never worship the angels. The second thing that we saw is that if any false doctrine is brought to us by the angels, we must reject it. The third thing that we saw is that we must not slander and speak mockingly or carelessly about the demons. And if we are talking to them, we only do it in the name of Jesus. So those are the three things that we saw. The fourth thing is to have the correct perspective regarding this whole idea of guardian angels. 
look at the wording which jesus uses over here he is talking about you know children over here and then later on when we, when we look in the you know in, in the in the same passage we see that he's not only talking about little children he's also talking about believers who are like little children belonging to god okay so um if you look at uh, the 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 same passage in luke and in other places we see that the little ones doesn't only refer to little kids it also refers to god's little ones you know because uh, you have that passage where it says if any of you uh, causes one of these little ones to stumble you know may you know may you be you know punished for it so over there it's talking about believers and um jesus warns and says if anyone tries to you know through false teachings if anyone tries to cause these little ones these believers to stumble then you know god's judgment would come upon them so in matthew 18:10 Jesus says see that you do not despise one of these little ones for i tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my father in heaven we have this very wrong idea that you know guardian angels are sitting around in our house guarding us protecting us like as if they are watchmen but look at this verse where are these angels located where are they situated it says so clearly for i tell you that's jesus speaking and jesus says for i tell you that their angels in heaven these angels are not sitting in your house doing you know uh, watchman duty these angels are in heaven and what are they seeing they always see the face of my father in heaven so i'm not very sure about this concept of you know one angel being assigned to one person there's no biblical backing for it it is talking about angels who have been assigned the duty of protecting god's people but i think they basically come to god's people whenever god sends them and says you know go you know you need to go and help so and so and so the angels come and do their work and they go back to heaven they go back and see the face of the father they are not watchmen sitting around inside your house doing guard duty okay so um i think maybe that would be a good way to look at this simply because jesus himself says for i tell you that their angels in heaven always see the face of my father in heaven okay so um we see many scriptures which talk about the angels coming and protecting guarding helping people on different occasions um second kings chapter 6 verse 17 it's not one angel who is sent at that time to you know protect elisha uh, because you see this is a this is a very um personal incident involving one single person the king of aram um is very worried that somebody among his you know um inner circle is leaking information to the uh, israelites so he says who you know when we when we come up with strategies and plans on attacking the israelites some of the israelites get to know about it beforehand which means somebody must be leaking the information and so then his people tell him it's nobody in your team is leaking the information it's uh, god who reveals these things to elisha and so the king of aram sends an entire army against this one man of god elisha so in the morning i mean they are basically in this place called dothan and when in the morning when elisha and his servant get up they see an entire army surrounding the city and that army has come there with one purpose to arrest one man and take him away as a prisoner so the servant gehazi is very very worried and elisha is not at all worried and elisha says god has sent his angels to guard us so it's not one guardian angel who is no appointed as a, as a lifelong guardian angel for elisha when the time of need came angels were sent in fact an entire army of angels were sent to guard elisha another example that we see is jesus himself uh, when he is speaking you know in the garden of gethsemane he says if i want i can call guardian angels to come and guard me 
you know, and you people will not be able to arrest me. And he, how many angels does he talk about? He talks about 12 legions of angels who will come to guard him. So it's not like one guardian angel who has been appointed. If there's a time of need, God will send how many of our legions of angels are required to take care of his people. Um, we see another um, mention of you know, angels being involved in people's lives. Uh, that would be Luke 16, 22. In Luke 16, 22, we are told that when Lazarus, the uh, this is not Lazarus, the, you know, the, the brother of um, Martha and Mary. This is the Lazarus who was the uh, beggar. So when Lazarus the beggar dies in Luke 16, uh, 22, it says that several angels, you know, they come and they carry him to uh, Abraham's bosom. So um, the idea that one each believer gets one guardian angel may not be biblical simply because there's nothing in the scriptures which actually brings out that point. On the other hand, we have many scriptures in the Bible which talk about how God sends his angels to his people to guard them, help them, protect them whenever there is a time of need. Um, the only reason I'm trying to emphasize this is that some people have an unhealthy interest in their guardian angels. They kind of develop an emotional bond with their guardian angels. You know, they are like, oh, there's this angel watching over me. I wish I could see him. I wish I could talk to him. I wish I could get to know him. I think that's a very unhealthy emotional bond to form with any angel. Our emotional bond should be with our Lord Jesus because he is far superior than any guardian angel. And that's what we are told, in fact, in scriptures. In Hebrews 1.4, this is what it says about our Jesus. Hebrews 1.4, if someone could read out. Having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they, in Hebrews 1.4, it's basically talking about how superior Jesus is above the angels. So it says, he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. So as superior as Jesus' name is to that of the angels, his superiority even in status is that superior. Uh, what name has Jesus been given? That's actually mentioned in Revelation 19.16 where it says, Revelation 19.16, it says, On his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. So even if you were to consider all these uh, principalities and powers and fallen angels as you know kings and lords, he is king of kings and lord of lords. He's above all of them. So the name which has been given to him is that superior to all angelic beings. So in his status, in his position, in his power, he is that superior to all angelic beings. So rather than forming any kind of emotional bonds with your guardian angel who may not even be there, you know, uh, because the scripture doesn't clearly say that each person is assigned one guardian angel, let our emotional bond and our trust be in Jesus, who is far superior to any, any angelic beings. Um, so it is Jesus who is our protector. And he will send whatever angels are required in your time of need to take care of you. We are told that very clearly in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. Uh, 2 Thessalonians 3, verses 2 and 3, if someone could read out. And we, then that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for not all have faith. But the Lord is faithful, who will establish you and guard you from the evil one. It says over here that the Lord is faithful. He will protect you from the evil one. So our faithful Lord, he will protect us. He will guard us 
so let him be our guardian so you know let the our emotional attachment and our trust not be in the angels who may have been assigned to us rather let our faith and let our trust be in our lord and savior who it says over here uh, will protect us from the evil one um so we are told in hebrews 1:14 that um you know it says in hebrews 1:4 yeah someone could read out that hebrews 1:14 are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation exactly these angels are ministering spirits who have been sent forth to serve those who will inherit salvation so it's god who is sending forth these angelic beings so as and when we require their you know uh, help they will be sent forth by god and um, hebrews 13:2 has another very interesting um, you know thing to say about angels uh, so you know before we get into our break if we could just read that hebrews 13 verse 2 do not forget to entertain strangers for by doing so some have unwittingly entertained angels so there are some occasions when no the angels just don't come down to the earth in spirit form but they actually come in a physical body and you know they merge among the humans looking human dressed like humans so he says over here you know the writer of hebrews he says on some occasions you know you people might have actually shown hospitality not to a human being but actually an angel who you know who has come down over here in the form of a uh, in the form of a human in the sense you know they have uh, come in the disguise of a human to accomplish some purpose of god so there may be occasions where a person needs actual literal physical help where god would actually send an angel in in a physical form to assist that person and you know we see we we hear uh, we read this um, stories and testimonies of missionaries you know in very um, difficult uh, regions where literally some stranger comes to them you know takes them th through a war zone takes them through some very dangerous territory and leaves them safely on the other side and then just disappears and when the person disappears they realize oh this was not a human who led us through the you know th through the uh, dangerous war zone it was an angel who actually led us so there are occasions where god so if, if god feels the need that you know you would require an actual angel in human form to come and help you he will actually do even that so the lord will take care of us in every way we are safe we are protected we are loved greatly by our lord and savior jesus christ so let our faith and trust not be in angels but let our faith and trust be in our savior who is far superior to the angels and who will send the ministering spirits as and when they are required you know to serve us um after the break we'll continue with some other you know um correct perspectives that we should have regarding angels so for now you know let's get into our break thank you